Well, thank you for that in Italian. I can't say I'm going to preach in Italian, so I hope you can understand. But, but ciao. <laughs> and hello, hello everybody. Um, my name is Peter King. Uh, I, I, I'm Penny's dad, but don't blame me. <laughs> She's grown up uh, as the son of a pastor's uh, a do- a son, a daughter of a pastor, <laughs> with being um, embarrassed from the pulpit. But there you go. So it's great to be here today. We we live down south. Uh, 450 miles, I think, away. It is down uh, in between Brighton. You've heard of Brighton uh, and Eastbourne. You may not have heard of Eastbourne, but right on the south coast we, we live. So, and uh, we came up on, uh, well, we arrived here on Thursday. Uh, we left on Wednesday, stopping over. Well, it's great to be here, and thank you very much, Keith, for inviting me this morning. Uh, I want to set the scene for us today, because our reading, as you will well know, takes, very, uh, takes place uh, around the temple. So let's just for a moment have a look at the temple itself, uh, just to remind ourselves um, just of the amazing structure that had been built according to God's plan for uh, the people of Israel uh, to worship, which they came to from the surrounding area every year um, to worship God uh, at the temple. Now, if you think uh, of a football pitch, the actual temple, and multiply that a number of times, you'll get the size of the temple. It it actually covered um, uh, 7,140 square meters. That's just its base of of the temple. Uh, And it was as high as about five stories of a house. So that just gives us a size, this great building that was built to the glory of God. Uh, And uh, it was made of marble, and it was made of gold, and inside, of course, there was gold uh, and silver ornamentation as well uh, to help us worship, help them worship God. Hundreds of thousands of pilgrims could be housed within the temple itself as they came to worship the Lord. It took a thousand priests trained as masons, uh, and 10,000 highly skilled laborers. They used 10,000 wagons, and it took them a year and a half plus to actually build this temple, which is just an amazing thing. Some of the blocks, and that's important, uh, particularly that that form the foundation of the temple, the the base blocks, uh, were 5,000 plus tons each. It gives you some sort of idea and and is a prelude to what we're going to look at concerning this scripture. Now, um, coming up on on the screen, yeah, you've already got it. Okay, so you see the temple in the middle there? And you might just be able to pick out the smoke of offering from the sacrifices going in front of the temple. That's it. That's a five-story high building uh, within the temple complex, massive uh, massive, massive complex. There's only about 1,600 feet of the western wall uh, remaining at the moment. But that's where it was. And to the right, uh, you'll see that's the Mount of Olives. And that's where the scene takes place. That's where the disciples uh, talk to Jesus and ask the questions about his second coming on the Mount of Olives. And you could see that they could see very clearly what was then standing, it's not now, of course, was this temple, this great edifice right in front of them. Um, I'm using the ESV. I've, I've grown to like the ESV, the UK version, because uh, I like it. <laughs> it's a good translation. So let me just first of all read to you the first uh, two verses again from that uh, section in Matthew 24. Jesus left the temple and was going away. And when the, his disciples came to point out to him the building of the temple, but he answered them, you see all these things, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Now, I gave you the size of the the stones at the base of the temple uh, and others. They were mighty, mighty, mighty stones. But what happened was there was a long war between the Jewish zealots and the Roman authorities. Let's remind ourselves that at this time, Israel was under Roman occupation. And in 70 AD, uh, the Emperor Titus came in with four legions of uh, Roman soldiers uh, and they ransacked the whole of Jerusalem and they burned down the temple. This great edifice which had stood uh, for so long uh, was burnt to the ground, raised to the ground. And molten gold and silver seeped 
through the cracks in the walls. The soldiers, wanting some sort of stipend, extra stipend, actually collected up. Uh, the Emperor Titus told them not to, but against his wishes, they collected up the silver and the gold, and uh, they used that to, uh, to um, uh, line their own pockets, as it were. So the disciples had said, oh, isn't that amazing? And you would have done as well if you'd have seen the temple in all its risen glory. Um, isn't that an amazing thing? And they would have thought that this was going to last for eternity. This was going to, nothing, this great edifice built according to God's prescription, this temple was going to be there for all time uh, and for people to come and worship him. But Jesus said, no. And there we are in 70 AD, the whole edifice was torn down. And you can go there today and you can see uh, that these stones, not one of them is left on top of each other. These great big stones were thrown down by the occupying and invading army. So we see then that it's, it's actually, according to Mark, Peter, James, John, and Andrew are with Jesus on the Mount of Olives. Verse 3 says, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him. He's gone from the temple now to the Mount of Olives, and there's, uh, they can see it clearly in their vision. And he says to them, uh, tell us, they say, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? These are questions that not just these four disciples ask, but we ask historically, particularly in the context of where we are right now with this, as Keith has said earlier, this mad, mad world which is so lost and so, so my, out of, godless, uh, let's face it. So the questions really that they were asking was, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? Now signs point the way. That's what they do. Um, you know, if you, you follow a sign to Hoyk uh, and you end up in Edinburgh, something's gone wrong uh, because the sign should point you to your destination. And that's what God's signs are all about. When the Holy Spirit comes and God moves in a powerful, mighty way. We have signs and wonders. We have healing of the sick, the raising of the dead, all the miracles which are still about today in God's power. And we need to be seeing in the church uh, in the UK, we need to be seeing the gospel preached with signs and wonders following according to the promise of God. But they are signs not for the church's benefit or the church's glory, they are signs and wonders that point us to Jesus, our Savior, our healer, our risen Lord who is alive and is coming back to us. Now, uh, many, uh, many uh, views are uh, perfectly legitimate uh, as to what the sequence of prophetic events are. Most biblical scholars, and certainly that's where I stand, would believe that the next prophetic event to take place is the rapture, which we hear about, for example, in the likes of 1 Thessalonians 4 and verses 13 to 18, when we will be caught up, those who are still alive, uh, the dead in Christ will rise first, there'll be a trumpet sound from, from heaven, and we'll be caught up with him in the air. Now, why do I believe that? Lay aside scripture. There will follow seven years of tribulation. And we think we've got things bad now. It is nothing to what is coming and what we're heading towards those seven years. And one of the reasons I believe that that will be allowed to take place, which is according, according to God's uh, prophecy, according to his prescription, that will be allowed to take place is because the Holy Spirit in the saints of God, that's you and me, will be taken up from this earth and literally all hell will be let loose. That's a horrendous time. But now, we're not in that position right now. Things are bad and getting really bad, and they're getting worse. But that's what we look forward to, I believe now, uh, is the rapture of the church. And that's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. Just blink your eye for a moment, just quickly. They reckon on average that ten, between 10,000 and 20,000 blinks we have in a day. We blink our eyes, 10,000. So in between one of those blinks, you're going to be here, you're going to be gone. Just like that. To meet with Jesus in the air. There'll be no more pain, there'll be no
no more heartache, no more suffering, but we need to be ready for that. The first way that we're ready, of course, is that we have repented and that we've turned to the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's the, the, the first thing. But then we need to make sure that we are ready for him and we're with, with him and that there is nothing between us and God. And if you have sin in your life today, brothers and sisters, come to God, repent, turn from it, receive his forgiveness, receive his cleansing, and move on in him because you just cannot mess around in these days of age with the Lord our God. Verses 4 to 8 of our reading says this, And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. I want you to notice that, see that. We're coming back to that. The title of the message today is, is uh, be not, See that you be not alarmed. And I want to come back to that as well. But two places, one is here, where Jesus uses a different word in the Greek, but they mean the same thing. And I'd like to expound what they mean later on uh, in our uh, looking at this text. And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed. See that you're not alarmed. That's the title of the message again. For this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Now, <coughs> I've never actually given birth. Myself. <laughs> but I was there when Penny was born, being her dad, and uh, there was nothing to it, really. It, you know, it was nothing. <laughs> nothing. Nothing at all. But I can remember when Penny, she was our firstborn. Uh, we, we have three. Uh, one's in Australia, one's in Brighton, and Penny the eldest is, is here. But I can remember, you know, when you have your first child, you're not terribly experienced, are you? And uh, I can remember uh, my wife, Penny's mum, she kept having, this happens, doesn't it? She kept having these mild contractions. Is this it? Should I take her in? Should I not? There was snow in Ipswich at the time, so it was, it, it, we were really snowed in, but we had to, you know, you've got to get, you got to get your wife there, haven't you, to give birth, whatever happens. Uh, and we had quite a few uh, of initial contractions, which you do just the beginning. Um, I remember one particular night, we had an Indian takeaway, and in the middle of the Indian takeaway, my wife, Penny's mother, uh, starts having these contractions. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to finish your Indian takeaway first, or get your wife to so. Well, we rang the hospital and said, what do you think? That happened three times, not with the curry, but with the, the contractions before we actually went in. Uh, we learned after the first time, go and get a takeaway at the moment and <laughs> until Penny was born. But it was the beginning of birth pains, which, as you will know, ladies, uh, as time goes on, get worse and worse and worse. The contractions become uh, closer and closer together until that thing, thing? Until that thing of birth I'm talking about, not the, 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 until that wonderful child is born, <laughs> is born. And that's where we're in now. We're, we're in those birth pains, the beginning of the birth pains right now. And what's going to be born? The kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. And you and I are going to be there one day if we know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We've done nothing to earn our salvation. Keith was reminded, and our sister followed that up this morning, that we are not perfect. We never have been perfect. We never will be perfect. But we are perfect in God's sight through the blood of Jesus. And by his grace and his grace alone, we are saved and kept before him and with him. But Jesus says some very interesting things here. He says, see that no one leads you astray. Now, he wouldn't have said that unless it was possible to be led astray. So he says, see, and again I'm going to come back to that phrase, see that no one leads you astray. We are to watch and pray. How do we watch and pray? Well, we see what's going on. I, I love the Today program in the morning. If you come to our house anytime, you'll get bored with 
the Today program, and I like to watch the news. Not to excess, I don't think, uh, because you can really depress yourself, but we need to see through the filter of um, secular media what is going on around the globe, particularly in our nation, in Russia, etc. Uh, and as we see these things, we, we need to pray, keep praying, keep praying. We have a, uh, twice a month we have an on, it comes through COVID, we have a, a Zoom prayer meeting called Intercessors UK. Very grand title, but well, I'm the only fella. <laughs> But, <laughs> but uh, we gather together with the same heart. We pray for the issues of our, of our nation, uh, and we pray also for a great revival uh, in the church and a great awakening in, in the nation. I still believe that, um, that that's, I believe with all my heart that we're going to see an awakening in our nation. But God wants us to be ready. He wants us to watch and pray. And we make, need to make sure where things, where folk will seek to lead us astray, that we do what? Yes, we pray, but we adhere to this from cover to cover. And we're currently involved uh, in an Anglican church down in the south. And the way the Anglican church is going at the moment is just absolutely horrendous. It's almost blasphemous, I would say, but... Uh, there you go. That's where the Lord wants us, and that's where we remain. Uh, but uh, see that no one leads you astray. We must get ourselves into the Word of God. Psalm 109, 19, verse 105. You all know it. You could recite it back to me. But your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So how do we measure so that we don't lead astray? Well, we measure it against the Word of God. If it's not in the Bible, if it's contrary to the Bible, it's wrong. Amen. End of story. It's wrong. God's Word is a... But can I just say at this point, brothers and sisters, that uh, although it's Keith's responsibility to teach you and to strengthen you in the Word of God, it's your responsibility to feed yourself. It's your responsibility to spend time every day reading the Word of God. I, sorry if this goes against what uh, you do, but I don't personally like the idea of reading through the Bible in a year. It puts me under pressure to read uh, stuff that, you know, and I don't really take it in. I do believe, and I do have sessions where we've taught this, uh, that yes, read a section, read systematically, but ask the Lord what he wants to say to you and meditate upon maybe just a verse or part of a verse. And then it zooms into you, and the law will show you uh, what he wants to show you, uh, if you if you watch and pray. But make sure that we're, we're in the Word of God, we adhere to the Word of God, and we allow ourselves to be led by the Word of God. But Jesus says this, you will hear of wars and rum rumors of wars. Now, we are in the groans and labors, and I haven't got time to go through all the things that have happened uh, in this particular, uh, since the 20th century began. In 1914 to 1918, what happened? First World War. 1929 to 1939, the stock market crashed in America, causing worldwide economic havoc. What happened from 1939 to 1945? Second World War, and so we go on. We have the Korean conflict, the Cold War, the Vietnam conflict, the Gulf War, and 2000 to present, uh, natural disasters and earthquakes, hurricanes and tsunamis. Exponentially, they have increased in both number and intensity. We've had COVID 2020 until the, uh, this global pandemic, which um, has taken the lives of over 4.4 million people. Uh, that's by August 2021. And uh, of course, we have radical Islam. We have the Twin Towers. We can remember that when the, the, the radical Islam uh, jihadists uh, destroyed the, the and, and changed the whole global situation around us. So it is true from the beginning of the last century until today, there is no doubt that rumors of wars, earthquakes, uh, pestilence and signs in the heavens have increased and the new age is about to be born. But the most severe contractions are just before us. Now we should not be fearing this 
it is a fact that the, these contractions are taking place increasing in intensity, but we should not be fearful. We've seen also such moral decline in our nation. Yes, around the globe, but in our nation. And so many ungodly laws have been passed since 1950. I haven't got time to go through them all, but we have uh, the Obscene Publication Act. Uh, that was lifted and eased. We have the Abortion Act. Um, and uh, only just recently in the Parliament in England, uh, we had the buffer zones. Uh, where you're not allowed, according to the law. And it was incredible the majority of MPs passed this law. Most of them, I have to say, were Labour MPs. Uh, and our MP, uh, Maria Caulfield, down in the South, uh, she's, she's very much uh, pro-life. She's, you know, she's good. She says she's a Christian. Not sure about that. But this, um, these buffer zones were brought into law by a majority within the Parliament. Uh, and we have a friend who comes on... Uh, uh, intercessory group, uh, who's a very much a pioneer. She's in her 80s, but she will stand outside praying, talking to people. Uh, look, you don't have to go through with this abortion. Uh, there are alternatives for you. And um, they'll pray for people. And the amount of young women that have been saved from that. You may have seen Sharon, what's her name? Sharon, um, uh, who's, the, who's, the, who's the lady that, uh, uh, whose husband is... Yeah, Sharon Osborne, yeah. Yeah, thank you. You're a better rocker than I am. <laughs> Sharon Osborne uh, put on Facebook recently as one of the worst decisions of her life uh, to have had an abortion. She, she has lived with it. Obviously, I don't believe that she knows the Lord Jesus as her savior, uh, but she's lived with it through all her life. Uh, Jesus, if we realize if we've had an abortion here today, we can come realizing it's wrong in repentance, seeking forgiveness, and God can heal us and cleanse us. I remember last time we preached um, in a place near to us called Peace Haven. I happened to preach uh, on the fact that I, I believe that two things have got up God's nose, and they're still getting up God's nose, is abortion and the whole LGBTQ issue. And we had someone come up the end of it. She was quite advanced in her pregnancy, and her boyfriend had been putting pressure on her to have an abortion. And she was a believer. She said, what shall I do? So we said, let's pray for you. Let's pray for you, because I don't believe the Lord wants you to uh, uh, have that abortion. And we prayed for her, and um, we never saw her again, did we? So I don't, we, don't, we don't know what happened, but we just believe that the Lord really spoke to her. But it is behoven upon us. Um, we all have to follow our calling, uh, but part of my calling, a strong bur a burden of mine, is to be involved with campaigning against these things. I am very much a part of the Christian Institute and uh, Christian Concern, uh, because I, I don't know, as Christians, we can't just go to heaven and not uh, protest throughout history folk have protested and life has been changed. Think of William Wilberforce, for example, and the slave trade. Think of um, the lady, I can't remember her name, in America who refused. Uh, Rosa Parks, that's it, yeah. Uh, she changed, was vastly instrumental in changing uh, the racial prejudice in America. But freedom of speech is under attack. Uh, and it's, as I say, it's just so many amazing how many people have been helped. Uh, through folk praying quietly. But do, do you know that the law, um, this, uh, this I must just say, this, this law uh, of these buffer zones around abor abortion clinics, um, that uh, even if you have driven somebody to an abortion clinic, this is what this law says, if you've driven somebody to uh, an abortion clinic, you're fine when you're outside the 150 meters um, uh, abortion buffer zone. But once you go into that, abortion buffer zone, although you're not going to have an abortion yourself, if you, if you have driven that person into that uh, from afar and within the 150 meters, you are guilty. And you, the law will get you as well. I praise the law because it went to the House of Lords as these bills too, and they chucked it out. Hallelujah. And uh, that's what, one of the reasons why we, and I'm sure you do too, pray about these things. Verses 9 to 13 
says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. But what I want to get back to is the words Jesus used twice. Similar words, not the same word, but they mean the same thing. And in Matthew chapter uh, 24 and verse 6, he says, See that you be not alone we are not to be fearful because Jesus has given us his peace. He is the Prince of Peace. Not to be anxious about these things. But that actually is not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, see, right, that you be not alarmed. The NIV gives a good interpretation um, of the, the Greek text for this word. See to it that you're not alarmed. Right? See to it. In other words, Jesus says to the four disciples who are with him on the Mount of Olives, make sure that you're not alarmed. Make sure that you're not caught unawares. And that is the word of God to us as well. We need to understand the times as the, uh, the men of Issachar. They understood the times in the children of Israel and they, were, they prayed and they were offer, able to offer counsel and wisdom to children of Israel. And Jesus is saying to us, now listen up if Jesus says it, not that the rest of the Bible is not just as valid, but Jesus is saying to us today, see to it, brothers and sisters, that you're not alarmed. And how do we do that? We watch, we pray, we read the Word of God, we learn the Word of God, we meditate upon the Word of God, but we equip ourselves theologically, and we are taught theologically about the times that we are in and what the Bible has to say about biblical prophecy and the last days. That initiative is with us. The disciples, again, they wanted to know when Jesus was coming, when would all these things happen? And that's a question which we have on our hearts, don't we? So Jesus says, see to it, brothers and sisters, here in Hoik Elim Church, see to it that you're not alarmed. See to it that you're not caught unawares. See to it that you understand, you have an understanding uh, of what is going on around you. See to it that you understand what the Bible has to say about these things. Why? The reason is because he doesn't want you to be fearful and caught by surprise. He wants you to be discerning. But brothers and sisters, we exist only to reach the world. And the world is getting more and more fearful. I remember conversations with Penny about the pandemic, that the real pandemic was not the pandemic as such, but it was gonna, what was going to result from the pandemic, and that was economic chaos and crisis. And praise God for what you did yesterday, this warm space that you're creating for people. Because, brothers and sisters, let's remind ourselves, part of us seeing to it is seeing that out there, in an increasing, almost daily way, people are becoming fearful. They're becoming frightened for the things that are coming upon this earth. They are dismayed. They don't understand. But you smell of Jesus. The aroma of Jesus is within you. And you might think, oh, well, I've prayed for that person for years. They've never got saved. They're watching you. They're watching you. They're watching Jesus in you. That's part of seeing to it that you're not troubled. Because they will say, they will perceive in you, what is it? You don't seem to be worried. You don't seem to be troubled. You don't seem to be, uh, what is it? What is it? I remember I used to do an awful lot more than I do now, funerals. And um, one of the funeral directors said to me, um, uh, what is it you've got 
Pete, what, what, what is it you've got? Whatever it is you've got, I would like to bottle it and have it myself. Well, you can't do that, but you can have it yourself. That's Jesus. But Jesus calls us today like he's never called us before to him to seek his face, to understand his word, to understand the times, to not be fearful, to not be alarmed, but to be equipped with what's going on around us, understand what the times are, and understand what this has to, to say about the Word of God. There's thousands of subjects contained within the Word of God. We must not get imbalanced, of course, but we must understand what is happening. If Jesus said it, that we need to understand what is going on, we better pay heed to what he says. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you. You left with us peace. You've given us your peace by your grace. You've cleansed us, you've forgiven us in as much as we know you as our Lord and Savior. Lord, help us to obey you, to see to it that we're not alarmed about the things that are happening in these birth pains which are growing stronger and they will grow stronger. Help us to be prepared that we can, Lord, preach to others. We can speak to others. We can see others, Lord, and they will come and they will want to hear from us. What is it you've got? I need to bottle it because I haven't got it. And as men's hearts fail them for fear for the things that are coming upon this earth, Thank you that you, the Prince of Peace, want to save them. You want to heal. You want to bring deliverance. I'm going to ask uh, for a, a show of hands now. Keep your eyes closed. And what I want you to do is to, if you feel it's the Lord spoken to you today, I want you to enlist. I want you to enlist in God's army when Jesus says, see to it, you're, you're going to say, I'm going to see to it. I'm going to make sure that I really equip myself for the sake of Jesus and the spread of the gospel, the extension of the kingdom. I'm going to equip myself with seeing what's going on around my eyes. I'm not going to, I'm not, Lord, I'm not going to, I'm not going to close my eyes, but Lord, open them for me and teach me prophetically to understand to understand what is going on from a biblical perspective. What I'd like you to do no pressure, but if you want to enlist in this army of the See To It Brigade just raise your hand now and I'll pray for you that the Lord will come upon you the Holy Spirit will come upon you and give you that desire such as you've never known before. Who wants to be part of the Seed to It Brigade? Okay. Going to pray. Father, come in power, we pray. Help us, Lord, to obey you. But, Lord, we will see to it. We will pay heed to you. And you'll help us, Lord, to understand the times we live in. Lord, to grow closer to you, that, Lord, we may be those that are able to help others during this time of great need. And if you're here today and uh, you're worried, you're anxious, you don't know the peace of Jesus at this time because you're worried about your future, okay? Jesus would not say, do not be anxious if there was not the possibility of us being anxious. But he does say, do not be anxious. But I want to just pray for you that you'll know the peace and you'll allow God to work out your circumstances right now. If you need to talk afterwards, then we'd love to talk with you and pray with you. But I want to pray now because it's very real what folk are facing. I want to pray for you for your peace. Is that you today? Is that you? If you'd like me to pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you upon these people, Lord, 
and grant them your peace, we pray, which is beyond their understanding. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And finally, if there's anybody here today that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I'd like to pray for you as well, that you may come to know this wonderful Prince of Peace as your Lord, your Master, and your friend. Is there anybody here today? Thank you, Jesus. Well, that's good news. We're all going to heaven then because we've all given our hearts and lives to Jesus. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you, Keith.